Hinton St. George in Somerset, the last Thursday in October, and the lanterns appear. These are just three of the many annual events that take place in Britain, which have been recorded by Doc Rowe, a man who for more than 40 years has been devoting his life to documenting such traditions and the people who take part in them. This programme is about Doc and his ever-expanding archive, and the fact that our impression of the national culture being as homogenous as its high street shops is not as true as it first seems. I have a database of just over 800 events. It would be a joy to think, you know, I could go around all of them, but I, I know that I've photographed over 180, and there are a series I go back year after year after year after year. So I, 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 I do serial collecting. And nobody understood that until the Silence of the Lambs came out. <laughs> but, but I think I do leave people, um, you know, un, undefiled, let's say. I hope so, anyway. Are you recording this one, Doc, or what? Hey, John, you're on. Uh, the sun went down behind John Hill Across yon dreary moor I can't fault Doc in any way. He's doing a great service for all the traditional things up and down the country. And I would hope everybody takes the same attitude as myself and uh, welcomes him and he'll do nothing but good for him. For to plough, and to sow, and to reap, and to mow, and to be a farmer's boy, and to be a farmer's boy. I've known Doc Rowe a long time and uh, his archive has been housed in various places. It used to be in his tiny flat in London. His bed was like six feet up in the air because a lot of, uh, a lot of his archive was underneath it. It's also been in a cellar in Bristol where uh, some vermin took quite a shine to it at one stage. And now it's in what was an old school on the outskirts of Sheffield. It's an old primary school. It says there's a lovely plaque on the wall saying Sheffield School Board, 1879. And it also hosts the Sheffield Boxing Centre and something called Beauty Within. And there's, some, there's a whole host of our house martins uh, flying around above us enjoying what is a lovely day today. So I think we should go to see Doc. He's standing over there, framed by a doorway above which says Girl School. You've seen, you've seen this archive of mine in many different phases and stages and states, so hopefully this will be a pleasant surprise for you. Uh, so here we are. Okay, if you could just give us a little tour. Yeah, well, there's no kind of order to it at the moment, except that everything is in its place. Here we've got rows and rows and racks and racks of um, box files uh, that contain field notes on specific places like Abingdon, Abbots, Bromley, Nightlow Cross, Ashbourne, and so on. You've got the Burry Man. And there? the Burry Man, of course. He's spreading over <laughs> lots, of, lots of files these days. So probably very soon he'll have his own filing cabinet. Hip, hip, it's the Barry Man's Day! <laughs> the beginning of my psychological year, if I can call it that, is, is actually May Day, May the 1st. And without hesitation, I have to be in Padstow. And for years, I, I've had butterflies in the stomach, I've had feelings of anxiety that I, I really shouldn't be there because I'm not Padstow, I'm not, I'm not local. And yet, the, the, you know, the ov overwhelming feeling is I've got to be there, unthinkable not to be. And so I'm there, and I'm there days before, and the, the build-up in the pubs and around the streets is absolutely phenomenal. The, you, you hear squeeze boxes, sometimes, you know, the kids playing for their first time, it's going to be their first May Day, and you get these fragmented chunks of May, May song as they're learning it on their melodians or accordions. And then the, the beat of the drums that comes out of the pubs, and it's... Your pulse actually takes on the, the rhythm of the drum, and it, it can be weeks afterwards. You're still having blood going through your pulse in that same rhythm, you know. And then we come up through the maypole, and then we go up all around the coach places and see the older people. 
and then we come back down and we go in for tea and then we come out again six o'clock and then the two horses will meet in the square and dance around the maypole and then they go their separate ways again but it all begins it all begins really on april the 30th music's played in the pub uh, after the pubs close, the musicians all move out in procession uh, into the main square where a huge maypole has been erected. This is not the prissy Victorian maypole, this is a solid maypole with flags and garlands on, not the maypole that we grew up with in schools that you dance around with ribbons. And just before midnight, at the start of May the 1st, we assemble outside the Golden Lion and at the very stroke of midnight, the voices soar up and they sing the night song. Unite and unite and let us all unite. Yeah. Unite and unite and let us all unite For summer is to come unto day And whether we are gone go from house to house through the night and it takes as long as it takes visiting local people singing to them by name and wishing them well for the May Day and saying that we'll call once more and to your house before another year which will be in about five or seven hours time And then in the morning, after perhaps an hour or so sleep, people are out on the streets again. Seven o'clock in the morning, the children come out with their osses. And at 10 o'clock, the, the blue ribbon oss comes out of its stable. And at an hour later, the old oss comes out, the old oss being uh, with a red, red colour. The, these osses, uh, they're not like the, the traditional hobby horse, the Victorian hobby horse, but they, they are actually, uh, it's, it's a man who is concealed under a, a very large frame which is draped with canvas, which is blackened with paint, so it's quite heavy. And, and his head is covered with a very heavy mask which represents the rider. And a, a symbolic horse head with real horse's hair is fixed to the rim of the frame. And he then dances through the streets teased on by a man with a club to the sound of accordions and drums. So it's distinctly different from the night singing. And this goes on from, well, as I say, seven in the morning until around about ten at night. Um, so it's no wonder that your pulse takes on that rhythm. I mean, Nora Chown's flat, which overlooks the Maypole in Pasto. And uh, I'd like to ask you, Nora, about Doc. It tells me he's been coming down here for 44 years. Yes. And what do you think about what he does? I mean, he's documenting this. It's essentially the same thing that happens every year. But do you think that's important, that he comes down and records that every year? Yes, I do. I, I really do. Why? Because he's done it for so many years. And he knows what goes on from year to year. So do you learn something from what Doc Oh, definitely. Does? What do you learn? All sorts. <laughs> <laughs> You're not telling me, though. <laughs> um, no. This year I went to Padstow with Doc Road to watch him at work and to find out if the people who interest him so much value what he does. 
This wasn't easy for Nora Chown to put into words, but the Reverend Barry Kinsman, a local historian and former head teacher in Padstow, was very clear. Any recording of any form of history is vital. And the old Cornwall Society have a motto, gather up the fragments that none be lost. So it's a similar kind of process. It's because if Doc has always given something back. Well, I, th I remember a certain echo that you put together that about 20 years ago. 1982. Uh, with a lot of the, the May Day photographs in. So we, yes, and I gather there's a book which I haven't seen yet on May Day custom. Which comes out today, actually. Today, the official launch. I think it's recording and is very important because Padstow is still a community that treasures an event like and protects it quite strongly, I think. So, Nora, have you been out? You've been out today yes. dancing with us? Yeah. What does it mean to you? Everything. We were born to it. The atmosphere is beautiful. You know, May Day is May, May Day. You're going to be there. First yes. Day. Yeah. Even if I had a broken leg. Like that. <laughs> yes. Well, what's happening now is that the two osses are coming together. So it's the end of the day, and and really, I suppose it's um, the unite and unite of the the song that they sing. The two osses come together. They, the the teasers exchange clubs and tease their, you know, their rival as it might have been up to this point. The blue ribbon's coming up. From the bottom, the old ass is coming from the top, and uh, I think they will meet up soon. So I shall go off and uh, photograph it yet again for probably the, I don't know, the 30th time in 40 odd years. <laughs> and it, it's different every time, you know, it's, it's just, just extraordinary. Doc is less a, an archivist, more, more of a performance artist in the way that he, for the last 40 years he's tirelessly gone around Britain re-recording these events. It's, it's more an obsessiveness that you'd associate with art, really, um, in that respect. And also just the way he does it and his uh, attitude to, to the material is really interesting and in the way he, he has a, a, a love of it. The day before Ascension Day, Ascension Eve in, in Whitby, is a scene of, of uh, an event that it's so extremely different to everything else. It's not only uh, an event that takes some 20 minutes to do, but um, it, it's quiet and, and gentle and somehow sums up everything that's uh, important about these seasonal events, uh, is the Whitby Penny Hedge. and just two or three men assemble on the foreshore in, in Whitby with nine upright willows and nine other willows that they place across. They build a hedge. And this hedge is on, built on the foreshore at low tide for obvious reasons. And its idea, the idea is it's got to withstand the three tides because it's a penance from the 12th century. The story goes that in 1159, two of the ancestors of the um, hedge builders were out hunting a, a wild boar. They chased it into a hermitage, and in the struggle that ensued, the hermit was killed. He forgave the men, but the Bishop of Whitby decided that, that wasn't good enough, so this penance was struck. So every year on Ascension Eve, the men have to go out, cut willow to make this hedge, which has to withstand the three tides. And if it doesn't withstand the three tides, then the, the families of this, these men will lose their lands. Oh, Donny! Oh, Donny! Oh, Donny! For years now, Doc Rowe has been ploughing a solitary furrow, recording these events without much attention being paid. But now the contemporary art world is beginning to take an interest. Doc recently played an important role in Jeremy Deller and Alan Kane's very successful Folk Archive exhibition, which was on show at the Barbican in London before touring Britain. 
It has now been acquired by the British Council and will tour the globe. I asked Turner Prize winner Jeremy Della about the collaboration. We basically wanted to use his expertise or for him to show his expertise off to an audience, to an art audience or general public, really. So we asked him to select maybe his 10 most favourite photographs and, and select some video that he'd taken over the years of things that he thought were really important in, in folk tradition and just do a little display within our show. So it was like a show within a show and we just gave him this space. He did it both at the Tate in 2000 and then again for our touring show. He's done these, his little section really, his doc section and, and also put together a scrapbook about what he gets up to. And since then, he's added to, to what we've done. He's, he's made us um, a berry man, which we're very excited about, and a penny hedge. As part of the folk archive, we were invited by the bailiff to take last year's penny hedge and put on display. It had withstood the three tides, I hasten to add. So we went down, clamped it between boards, and uh, it's now beautifully varnished, looking permanently wet and draped with seaweed as well, all authentic stuff, and is about to go on tour around the world. It'll look like a piece of minimal sculpture. It's a bit of Arte Povera. <laughs> Oh, one more at the front, uh, Martin. I'm Reg Hall. I'm one of the musicians of the Hampton Morris. I'm very fond of Doc. I, I, he's a great pal of mine. I think what he does is wonderful. He goes round to all these places and records uh, stuff that other people ignore, and it's all full of life, and it, it's got great humanity, and he records it, and he films it, and he takes still photographs, and he does sound recordings. He's been doing it for years. <laughs> There's around 4,700 cassettes there. And you've got your uh, collection of LPs. And yeah. And up here, and huge canisters of, uh, what is it, 16 mil? 16 mil, mil. yeah. Most of these date from yeah. the, uh, the Future of Things Past, a film that was made by Elizabeth Wood for Channel 4 in 1985. And we spent two years going around the country filming 19 events. These were events that I knew reasonably well. And so I checked with each of them that, that they would be happy about this filming. And there was only one, actually, who said no, because they were worried about the, the intensity of crowd that might come afterwards. We did well in educating a lot of people as well, that you can film without actually getting in the way. Because there was a one, one event, someone came up at, at midday and said, when are you going to start filming, Doc? And I said, well, we've been filming since 7 o'clock this morning. So just remember that when other film crews come up. You can get the, the, the goods without getting in the way. We disregard so many of our events like the Morris dancing, the sword dancing, the rapper dancing, uh, we've got a fantastic variety and diversity of, of performance styles and, and dance, and, and we, we are, we, we're embarrassed by them, we don't like them. And yet, when you see two or three Morris teams together, and you seriously look at them, you can actually see the fantastic variety of stepping, of performance, of movement. Bampton, Headington, Abingdon, and Chipping Camden are the four that have really stayed the course over the centuries. And Bampton on the late May bank holiday is just a joy, because I meet the likes of Francis Shergill, who, who through thick and thin, have, have, has carried on the, one of the Morris teams. And Francis now, bless him, is uh, partially blind. He's there with a Zimmer frame this year, and he had carefully decorated the Zimmer frame with coloured ribbons and... I don't know if there was a bell there. He should have had a bell on the way he was driving it. Well, I'm Francis Shergold. I, I started Boris Dancing when I was 15. Packed up when I was about 70 odd. I was square for quite a good many years. And I, when I packed up, they made me honorary president, which was very, very nice. I was out on two sticks last year, but I got this good tool now. It's very good. I can stand and have a rest, you see. But when you've got sticks, you can't rest. Oh, very good. Well, it's an old tradition of... When the BBC did a television programme years ago, they interviewed me down at Will Manor, and uh, 
So they locked it being going then, I said. And I, no, I didn't know this until I saw it on the television in the pub after. He said, how long do you think it's been? I said, well, 600 years as far as I can remember. <laughs> but I didn't know that. Of course, when it came out on the telly, all the lads said, oh, no, me, you know. Yeah. I think that um, Doc's got a thing about evolution and about change and about life. And the, the old collectors who used to come out and just take one photograph in the old days or they would come down and take the tunes, they missed, it wasn't their fault. I mean, it was a different period. But they missed what was going on. And because it's so lively and so constantly changing and living and, and uh, it's so really alive, and Doc knows that. And when he comes and takes all his pictures and his sound recordings and his videos and everything, he's actually doing it year by year and building up a huge sort of document. Each year it's different, and yet each year it's the same, and he's just documenting all that. And in front of us now, there's a, there's a wall of filing cabinets. Uh, what, what have we got in here, Doc? So these are the transparencies. Um, there's about 42,000 of them. And they're indexed according to place, location. So we've got Abbotsbury, Antrobus, Ashbourne, Baker, yeah. Bampton, very well. Yeah. And then within that cluster, they will go according to the year. So there's 1981, 1980, 1983, so on. Uh, how many, I mean, when you go to an event, I mean, how many shots do, do you come up with? It varies, according to my pocket, really. I think nowadays with digital technology, it, it, you know, you can shoot. Increase. And uh, they have increased. Because I've got the ability and the skill over years of, you know, waiting for that moment, I'm finding that there's lots of moments on the, on the digital card that I don't have to delete so I finish up with a lot more so that 92,000 pictures that existed two Easter's ago is now 194,000 so that's just in the space of two years so it's actually doubled the collection this is the proverbial you know dot goes under a bus we're going to mm. lose we're going to no. lose a lot of content no you're not going to lose any you're going to get the context because these are actually taken in the sequence they're 80 81 82 84 yeah so they are they are a sequence they're like a film um so you can see what goes on and because i've actually taken detail this is abbotsbury garland so you can see the detail you can see the the people that are doing it and all the rest. all the information should be there the field notes will tell you what their names are hopefully <laughs> I've been going up to Scotland, to South Queensferry, and on the second Friday in August, there is this remarkable event called the Burry Man. And early on Friday morning, from about 6.30, this volunteer who actually has to apply to the Ferry Fair Committee to, to do the task is covered in the burdock seeds, is covered in burrs, and... He's covered from head to foot, and the only part of his anatomy not covered is his hands. And he then does a very painful perambulation around the, the, the town for about seven hours, uh, stopping at odd places to receive drinks, usually unmeasured whiskies. And in August, it's sometimes a really blisteringly hot day, so he suffers in all ways. And the idea is a kind of scapegoat that goes around the community, and people come out of their houses and, and give him money, which is for him. Thank you. And if I say that last year, he had the equivalent of 23 unmeasured whiskies, with perhaps the occasional half a lager to wash it down. Um, it's, it's some endurance. Hey, hey, buddy, it's the Burry Man's Day! The previous Burry Man, Alan Reed, did it for 25 years. And young John Nicholl, who has been doing this now for five, six years, he's just a splendid, um, you know, carrier. He's... <laughs> You know, people were saying to me, you know, see the guard as a, a kind of 
you know, a, like performance art or something like that. Mm. You know, and I suppose like you, you could perhaps see a tie in with that. I don't regard it as that at all. I think it's uh, much more important than that. I think. The Buddy Man's on my CV that I'm sending away just now. <laughs> but it's, but it's under a, it's under a kind of, you know, it's under a kind of miscellaneous. You know, it's like you know, I'm Buddy Man of South Queen's Ferry. Hey, hey, Buddy! It's the Buddy Man's day. <laughs> Doc has made us a uh, full-size replica of of a Berry Man, i.e., someone within a Berry Man costume. So it's like a mannequin covered in burrs which looks incredible. And it's a fantastic thing for an exhibition as well, to have something that's life-size. It really helps. So he's done this labour of love for us and uh, decorated it. And I think it'll go down very well because the collection soon will be travelling the world and I think it will make an incredible impression on people. I've got to... Oh, hot cross bun. We have a remaining hot cross bun, which used to be hung outside my door. I've, uh, I understand that some of your hot cross buns uh, uh, disappeared not so long ago. They were eaten by biscuit beetle, which is an embarrassing thing to say when you're talking about art life. This one shouldn't have such stuff, but uh, there we go. It really does beg the question, Doc. Why, why would somebody have a collection of, of hot cross buns? I think you also had chocolate at one point. Well, 25 years ago, I, um, I started doing what people <laughs> I was recording was doing, was hanging a hot cross bun inside the front door. You see, there's, there's, there's the string. And, um, of course, you have to do it on Good Friday, baked on the day itself. And it doesn't go mouldy. That, that one's about 10 years old. It looks like a rock. Well, <laughs> the idea in the old days was that if you had an a, a affliction of the throat or some such, you would just simply grate that into some water and eat it. I, I've not tried it myself, but, uh, but uh, no, they're all sort of cling filmed and double wrapped so that biscuit beetles cannot... Ooh, hello, what's that? <laughs> 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 it cannot exist in them. So there's, there's, there's three or four crates there of, of um, artefacts, really. I was uh, born in Torquay at the end of the, the war and uh, christened David R., David Richard. Uh, when I went to school, that became DR, became doctor. So I was actually doctored at a very early age. But Doc Rowe actually is a doctor. He was awarded an honorary doctorate in music from the University of Sheffield in 2002 for his research work into vernacular culture and traditional music and only a few weeks ago was awarded the gold badge of the English Folk Dance and Song Society. He now rubs shoulders with late greats such as Rafe Vaughan Williams, Cecil Sharp and Bob Copper. He gives talks, lectures and workshops all over the country and has written several books, the most recent of which is May Day, The Coming of Spring published by English Heritage on, you've guessed it, May the 1st. What really started me was, uh, I, you know, I grew up in the 50s listening to As I Roved Out, the Sunday morning programme, which featured lots of old singers. Wilfred Pickles, I think, was quite something, you know, the Avagojo. It was just that fantastic kaleidoscope, I suppose, of British voices, the regional accents. You know, it was very exciting, maybe because I didn't have one myself. They heard the bang five mile away. It was the very thing that appeared. They found the collar on the ground, but the vicar disappeared. <laughs> and the vicar's wife, Denise, or didn't seem too pleased, but her didn't turn the air. Her aunt was still touched over her head, but the rest of her were bare. <laughs> the village copper heard the banging up the road, he nips. He was plastered all over his marrow skin, and he's moving full of fit. <laughs> The village nurse was expecting her first, and her husband jumped with joy. He heard the banging up some stairs, and he found three girls and a boy. <laughs> but what was being said to me, I think, was that the BBC had gone out in the early 50s and recorded the last of these traditional songs and singers. I was confused, because this was the, the august body of the BBC. Why were they telling me lies? And, and that later went into a kind of anger because it was disrespectful to all those people that were still singing or maintaining these songs and traditions, as I later found out. And I was confused because I'd been over 
on Dartmoor a number of times, and I'd heard the likes of Bob Cann stepping on tables, in fact, you know, and, and singing and playing these songs and tunes. Though, although they didn't call it folk song, necessarily, I obviously was pretty clear that this was the same sort of material that the BBC was telling me that I'd died out. I think 1963, 62, 63 was a, a very significant year because both of those years uh, involved me in going to Padstow to the May Day for the first time and also meeting a character who was a BBC producer, Charles Parker, who probably was the biggest influence on my life ever. Charlie was on the last of the radio ballads, The Travelling People. The radio ballads were a series of programmes that he'd done with 